Substitute whatever we put a frame in there, okay, for that. That's all these terms. Okay, here says y double prime of b. That's right. So I just put y double prime of b right there. Y prime of b is right there. Yes, as many times as you have to. What's up? I have a question about the triangular mes meshes. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, how do you change the geometry for the yeah, kind of meshes? The so the uh, so if that's done through a, a mesh element. I mean, oh, sorry, mesh uh, method type. And so if you follow, so you the, go the where it's insert, you go method. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, okay. And then so uh, under after you create that at the bottom left, you'll see you know, the element shape. And so it will be the default is quadrilateral dominant. And you switch that. Oh, okay, so yeah. then it's like a drop down. The drop down. All right. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yep. Yeah, you just move like move like <laughs> Yeah, so then all you have to do is compare coefficients and solve. I don't know coefficients and solve because you have to get the left hand side has to be you know, 16x minus 50 percent. So you have to find the coefficients um, C3, C4, C5, and C6. So you have to find these coefficients and then make the left hand side equal to the right. So what you end up doing is something like a four C4 is equal to the same as that size. So it's just a bunch of algorithms. Just comparing the um, barcode.
Jesus. Yeah, the steps. I don't know if that's just just the same or two. I mean, honestly, I see that. So, I Yeah. 
All right, it's uh, four o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good, good. It's hot outside, so you know, make sure everyone's staying cool and staying hydrated. You know, it's uh, it's, it's tough to be outside nowadays. So, so hot. Okay. Um, so the plan for today is we're going to just uh, keep trudging right along, and so we're almost done talking about bones, and then after we're done talking about bones, we're going to start talking about um, muscles, right? Um, so I guess uh, one announcement I have is uh, member homework one is out there right now. And so homework, you know, so far in this class, we are just going over just it's basically just a biology class. And so what you what you'll see from the first homework is that it's all just conceptual questions. So we haven't really gone over any types of like problem solving or calculations yet. Um, that's going to come, you know, very soon after um, probably in week four. Um, and so, we, you know, the first homework just consists of just homework, just problems and questions that you can find just by kind of reading through the lecture notes or um, or coming to lectures. Right? Um, all right, and so um, all right, and so I think there's a question in the chat. So I, I think Pablo lost his water bottle. So if someone finds it here, then uh, I guess just let him know or or let me know and I can let him know. Okay. Uh, Pablo, what color is your water bottle? I guess he's AFK. White. He's a. It's a white. It's a white hydro. So if that's if someone sees it around here, just uh, just let me know. Okay. All right, and so uh, besides that, are there uh, any any questions I can answer before uh, we get started for today? Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and pick up where we left off. So we, we're almost done with bones, and so the only thing we have left to talk about is just uh, fractures. Okay? So let's go ahead and talk about that. All right, so we spent all of last class talking about, you know, all the different, uh, you know, characteristics of bones, you know, what, what role they serve in the body and, and all the different, uh, uh, you know, how they grow and develop and all the different diseases that are associated with bones. And so the last thing we've, we've yet to go over are, you know, probably with the thing that people think of, or one of the first things people think of when they think of bones is fractures. Okay? And so a fracture, you know, the, uh, um, the definition for it is that a fracture is any kind of disruption in the continuity of the bone. So anything that anything anything that's a crack or anything anything ranging from just a small crack or to you know the bone just completely breaking apart they all kind of are characterized as a fracture. Okay? Um, and so you know the way the way that fractures happen is that you know because bones are made up of a, a material just like you know everything else once the internal stresses inside the bone exceed its yield strength that's that's when bones start to crack that's when they start to fracture. Okay?
And so just like any other type of material, you know, the way that we develop internal stresses is by applying external loads, right? And so, you know, and we, and we, you know, it's kind of a fancy way of saying that, you know, if you apply very strong forces to your body, um, you know, more so than your bones can handle, then the bones are going to break, right? And so let's say that you jump off a very high building and, you know, you kind of land on your feet and then that sends a huge force through your, through your, uh, through your bones and that could be enough to fracture. Okay. And so there's, there's lots of different types of fractures out there. And uh, depending on the direction, the magnitude, and the uh, geometry of the fracture, they're characterized differently. Okay. And so if you look up, if you look up, you know, pictures of fractures online, you'll find all the different types of fractures out there. Okay. Uh, you know, the focus for this class, you know, we're going to be focusing a lot more on the muscles. And so I'm not going to go over the different types of fractures, but if you're curious, you know, you can just look them up and, you know, there's lots of very gruesome images out there of, of fractures. But I did want to talk about, you know, um, what are some certain situations that put you at risk for fractures more so than, than others? Okay. And, you know, that ha and all this kind of, um, you know, references back to what we talked about on Tuesday, right? And so on Tuesday, you know, we talked briefly about uh, the material properties of bone, right? And so we know that bone is an anisotropic material. And what that essentially means is that the bone is going to be stronger in certain directions than the others. Right? And in particular, you know, the type of loading that bones are meant to withstand the best are compressive loads. Okay? That means if you were to kind of compress your, your limbs or kind of push them together, you know, generally it's it's quite hard to fracture your bones in that direction, right? Uh, of course, that doesn't mean that you can't do it. Uh, you, you definitely can. It's just going to be a lot harder than, than other directions, okay? Other types of loadings, however, are, um, are much easier to break your bones, okay? Uh, one thing I think we mentioned briefly last time was bending. And so bending moment, just to kind of remind you of something like this. And so let's say we have our long bone right here. And bending moment is when we apply basically moments on each side of the bone. Okay. So let's say that we apply moment just like, just like that. Okay. Bending is very unique because, you know, if we, you know, if we kind of look at a cross section of the bone right here, and so let's say that we tip out a cross section just like that. And so we took a cross section of bone and bending, right? We have kind of like a kind of like a, 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 a cross profile here, right? And so if you look at the internal stresses here, okay, you know, it might look something like this. 
And so in bending, you know, we kind of create the situation where one part of the bone, in this case, the bottom part, this part here will be in compression. Okay, because we're really bending the bone. And so, you know, the bottom part of the bend is, is gonna be compressed against each other, right? So the bottom part will be good. And so, you know, the bottom part's in compression and, you know, we don't generally don't have to worry about that. But this top part here, you can see, is gonna be in tension. And so on the top part of the, of the bone, of the bone in bending, you know, you're gonna have the bone cells that are, you know, we're literally kind of trying to pull them apart, okay? And that's not good because we know that the bone is gonna be a lot weaker in tension than it is in compression, okay? And so this right here is big danger, okay? All right, and so any kind of motion that puts your bone in, into this kind of bending, bending, um, you know, bending moment, it's gonna be dangerous, okay? And so one, one that happens you know, quite often in sports is uh, when you uh, plant your foot in the ground. Okay? Okay. And so let's say that you know, we have, let's say this is a soccer pitch. Okay? And so let's say that we have a person's foot. And let's say that this is an athlete that's you know, preparing to kick a ball. And so his, uh, his other foot is, is planted into the ground, okay? And so what can happen is that, you know, especially in contact sports, you know, if, if something were to strike this, uh, this foot here, okay? so let's say another player comes in and he you know, slide tackles is this player. Okay, so we have a force. We have a force that comes in like this, okay? While the foot is planted, what's happening there is that, you know, if you look at the bone underneath, you know, let's say that this is your, uh, your fibula or your tibula, okay? This bottom here, this bottom here is gonna be fixed, you know, because the, you know, the foot is fixed to the ground. But then if you apply the force up here, right? Then what's the bone, what's the bone gonna want to do? It's gonna want to bend, right? And so if you have a fixed condition on the bottom, but if the force being applied perpendicular to the top, you know, the, the, the bone is gonna wanna do this. This is of course exaggerated. It's, it's not gonna bend as much, but that's the kind of motion that you would um, uh, expect but that's the kind of deformation that you would expect in a bone that's loaded just like that. And of course, this is bad because, you know, in the parts up here, which are being kind of uh, stretched like here, you know, these parts of the bone here are in tension because of the bending moment that's being applied to this, uh, um, you know, to this bone, right? And so that's a very, you know, high risk situation where, you know, you might, uh, uh, you might get a fracture because you know you have parts of your bone that are in, in tension. Okay? And so that's something to look out for. And so you know if you if you play sports, you know especially contact sports like basketball, soccer, football, things like that, you know you have to be really careful about when you kind of plant your foot, because if if something were to hit that that foot that's planted, then you know you could cause a lot a lot of stresses within the uh, than the bones, which could cause a, a fracture. Okay. And so I'd say, you know, for, for most, you know, I'd, I'd say this is probably the most typical way people get like a tensile type of fracture in, in their bone. Um, Cause you know, it's not often that, you know, unless you're kind of into medieval torture, you know, you're not sitting onto a rack and someone's pulling your bones, right? So that's, that's, that doesn't happen a lot, at least not in, in normal circumstances. But you know, this is something that's a bit more common that I think people don't realize could be a high risk, uh, high risk activity. All right, any questions on on this? Okay. All right, so that's bending. Right. Another another way that uh, um, another uh, high risk activity that can cause fractures in your bones are is uh, some kind of torsional movement. Okay. 
And the main, the main danger with torsional loading is that it primarily produces shear stresses within the bone. And just like in and just like tensile um, forces or tensile uh, stresses, um, bones are very weak to shear loading uh, as well. Okay, and so a torsional load, you know, I'm going to keep using the example of a long bone just because I think it's the easiest one to do. Okay, a torsional load is you know kind of think about the motion of of you taking a water bottle and kind of twisting the cap off, right? So that's kind of like a twisting motion along the shaft of the, of the bone. Right? And so a torsional load, it's a little bit hard to draw in 2D. Okay might look something like this. Okay. And so you're taking the two ends of the bones and kind of twisting it as if it were like kind of a water bottle, okay? And so this is, this is really dangerous for the bones as well, because that's gonna be a, uh, a big, um, it's much more likely to cause a fracture. And so one instance where this happens uh, often is for uh, skiers and snowboarders actually. Okay. All right, and so if you've ever gone skiing or snowboarding before, you know that you know part of your equipment is that you have you know relatively heavy boot, and that boot is attached to either your ski or your snowboard. Okay, and if you fall, sometimes what can happen is that you know the the ski or the snow or the snowboard can kind of twist your entire leg in kind of a, a weird direction. Okay. And so if that occurs, or you know, let's say that your ski gets caught in something and, and the rest of your body is, is, is twisting, right? And that's going to cause a lot of torsional stress, a lot of shear stresses on your bones, which can cause a fracture, you know, pretty easily as well. Okay? So that's that's a big way that people get injured in skiing and snowboarding, snowboarding as well, is you know, usually their foot uh, gets caught on something or their board or their ski gets caught in something and the body kind of twists a certain way. And that, you know, if, if it doesn't cause a fracture, you know, it might cause like a muscle strain or maybe a ligament um, sprain as well. Okay. And so that's something to look out for if you're uh, going snowboarding. Although, you know, snowboarding sounds really nice right now with how hot it is. Wouldn't mind getting away to uh, snowboard on the mountain for a bit. But I don't think there's any snow right now. Okay. Um, and so, you know, if, if, you, if you were involved in these kind of sports, you know, you probably heard of some of these risk factors before, but, you know, I think this connection of, you know, these risk factors com um, connected to, you know, the material properties of bone, that's kind of why people view these as, as big risk factors. Okay, and so the last type of fracture I, I want to go over is a, a stress fracture. And so a stress fracture is, is kind of uh, unique, and it's, you know, probably something that you've heard in the news quite a lot, okay? And so a stress fracture is, is you know, I, I think the name stress fracture is not that very good, but I think the better name for a stress fracture would be uh, a fatigue fracture. Okay. And so these occur when a bone is exposed to repeated low magnitude forces over a long period of time.
And so, you know, if you, if you, if you have a situation where you're kind of stressing your bone in kind of a low magnitude environment, then, um, you know, over long periods of time, that puts you at risk for a stress fracture, okay? But it's actually not the low magnitude um, um, loadings that actually cause the stress fracture. But what it does is that it kind of, um, you know, in, in, in a sense, it kind of lulls your bone to sleep, right? And so it gets, it kind of gets your bones used to, um, you know, this type of loading. Because remember what we discussed is that bone is a bone, your bone tissue is, is, is very much active, right? And so it responds dynamically to the environment around it. And so if you continually expose it to these kind of type of low magnitude, you know, loads, then it kind of gets used to that. But then later on, you know, let's say that you apply, you apply a, a more higher magnitude load to it, then it's kind of too much for the, the bone to handle at, at once, right? Isn't there something like, I've heard of like people's shins that have like micro fractures all along and it makes them stronger? Is that, mm. or does it make it weaker? So those, so uh, you're talking about like shin splints basically. Um, so they, they are, um, so typically it's, it's not stronger or weaker, it's, it's, it's just painful for, for people. And so if you, anytime you have any kind of uh, fractures or, or things in your, in your, in your bones, it's gonna cause uh, pain. But probably, you know, the, I think the sense of, you know, people thinking that it, it makes the bone stronger is that, you know, once it kind of fractures in, in one point, then your bone's going to kind of react and try to reinforce it as much. Uh, and it's going to try to reinforce the areas around it too. And so if you have kind of the tiny fractures, then it'll reinforce the other parts of the bone. It's just still going to be really painful because you still have a fracture in your, in your bones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so along, along that line of thought, actually, you know, one, one type of, uh, or one group of people that are uh, particularly vulnerable to, uh, to stress fractures are people that like to run uh, very often. Okay. And so runners are particularly, you know, the, the kinds of stresses that they expose their, their bones to kind of exactly fits in this category, right? And so especially ones that kind of just lightly jog, um, you know, around. And so let's say that they go on a jog every day, right? And so that jogging kind of exposes your leg bones to kind of this relatively low magnitude stress and your bones kind of get used to it over a long period of time. But then, you know, if suddenly that they, they're exposed to a high amount of, of stress, let's say that they jump, they jump down from a high, um, high point, then you know it might it might be enough to cause a stress fracture in their legs, um, and they'd be more more vulnerable than you know if they if they didn't run every day. Okay. Okay. And so one way one way that runners can kind of avoid that is that if they you know if they modify the the length and the intensity of their workouts, and so that you know it kind of keeps the bones kind of more dynamic, um, you know, so they don't get used to kind of the same routine every day. That's one way that they can help avoid uh, stress fractures. All right, any questions on, on this? Yeah. All right, and so that's, all, that's it about bones. And so let's start talking about uh, muscles, which are gonna be a big focus for this class. So muscles, you know, muscles are, Kind of the next layer up from the bones, right? And so on top of your bones, you have the muscles, and on top of the muscles, you have your skin. Okay, and so muscles play a um, you know quite a different role in the body. Where you know on the one hand they do help with the strength, and they do help with you know providing a rigid structure to your body. You know the primary um, role for muscles is to provide motion. Uh, 
for your bond. And the reason for that is that your muscles are one of the only types of tissue or the only, one of the only types of cell in your body that can generate, um, that can generate a force. So for this lecture and the next one, you know, we're going to go over the kind of the general properties of, of muscles um, in terms of, you know, how they behave as a material, um, as well as the structural organization of, of the muscle, um, as well as, you know, some common muscle injuries as well. So let's start with the, uh, let's start with the, the properties of the muscle. Okay. And so first of all, you know, compared to bones, you know, muscles have a very different feel to them. And so where bones are considered, you know, hard tissue uh, because of all the calcium that's, that, that comprises their, uh, um, their volume, muscles are more soft tissue. And of course, you know, because they, they don't have these minerals, it makes them a lot more compliant. Okay? And so muscles can adapt and kind of change their shape, you know, much more easily than bones. Right? And so you can, you can go ahead and, you know, you can look at any muscle in your body, right? And so if you look, you know, just at your, your bicep muscle in your arm, right? And so by going through all these different motions, your bicep muscle is going to change shape uh, quite a bit, right? And so that's, that's kind of why that they're, they're soft. Um, and so besides that, you know, there are four other kind of um, characteristic um, properties of, of muscles that, uh, that we often talk about. Right, and I'll, and I'll, and they kind of fall into kind of two groups, um, you know, two groups of two. Okay. Right, so first, the first property is extensibility. Okay. And so the extensibility property means that it has the ability to be stretched or to increase in length. And that goes right along with its, uh, you know, the fact that it's soft tissue, right? And so since it's soft, you can take the muscle and kind of stretch it almost like a, almost like a rubber band. Okay. Okay. Two is elasticity, right? And so elasticity refers to the ability to return to its normal length after being stretched or compressed.
Okay. And so again, you know, think of like a rubber band, right? And so you can stretch a rubber band as, as much as you want, but if you let it go, then it's gonna, it's gonna want to return to its kind of default configuration, right? And so muscles are exactly the same. Okay. And so these two, these two properties here are, are often grouped together because you know, they're they cut together. They kind of tell us that muscles behave very much like an elastic solid. Okay. And so think of any kind of material um, out there. So, you know, just like any kind of material, you know, even, even this, this Apple pencil right here, right? And so, you know, you can't really see it much, but if you pull on it, it's actually increasing in, in length, but if you push it together, it, it, uh, it compresses. But then as soon as you release that force, it's gonna to return to its default configuration. Right? So most, most materials, you know, um, exhibit elastic behaviors. Some you can see the elasticity more than others because some are more stretchy than others. Uh, but muscles uh, partic in particular exhibit that elastic behavior. Um, and you see it a lot more because muscles are quite, quite soft. Okay. Okay. And so just like any elastic um, solid, uh, whenever a muscle is stretched, there are internal forces that develop that you know, try to return it back to its equilibrium position. Okay. And so if we have a, a muscle, you know, let's say that it's something like this, okay? So there are the muscle fibers, right? So let's say that this is the equilibrium position of the muscle. Okay. If you stretch the muscle, you know, let's say that you stretch it so that it gets longer, okay? It gets longer, it gets thinner. What's going to happen is that inside the muscle, and this and this is totally passively too, so this is not something that you actively have to, to do, right? Inside the muscle, there are going to be forces that are going to want to return the muscle back to its, its original position, okay? okay. And so those internal elastic forces are going to want to return the muscle back. Back to okay, so this is back to its equilibrium. Okay. And so muscles produce these internal forces, but the, the tendons do as well, right? And so your muscles attach to the tendons, uh, and if you uh, um, you know, if you're not aware, the tendons are the, the parts of the body that attach to your muscles and that they attach to the bones as well. And so they kind of act as like, almost like the glue that attaches your bones to the muscles, okay? Okay. So we're not, we're not going to talk about tendons too much in this class, just because they're they're just kind of another form of, of soft tissue. Um, but you know it's it's important to talk about here when you're talking about the elastic properties. Okay? And so based on this fact, based on the fact that both muscles and tendons exhibit this kind of restoring elastic forces, um, you know we have this kind of elastic model that's been developed for for muscles and tendons. Okay.
right? Because I think, you know, the first kind of elastic, um, you know, um, I say elastic thing that I think most people learn in their classes is a spring, right? And so we can model a lot of the behaviors of muscles actually with a spring, okay? And the same thing with the tendon. And so, you know, let's say that we have something like this, okay? Well, let's say that this is like a string right here. Okay? And so this right here is a spring. This here is another spring. Okay. I'm gonna draw one additional component like that as well, okay? All right, so let me go ahead and label these. And so this spring right here, this spring is called the PEC, which I'll label in a second. This spring down here is the SEC. And this component right here, this is what I call the contractile component. At the two, at the two ends of this contraption here, we have you know, two, maybe two limbs in your body. Okay, so this will be limb one. Okay, maybe this is like the upper arm, and this is limb two, which is the bottom, the lower arm, maybe. Okay. And so this could represent the uh, the bicep in your. Okay. All right. And so first thing I want to first thing I want to point out here is the contractile component. Okay. And so in this in this model right here, this the contractile component is the only one that can actively develop force. Okay. And so if you were to relate this to kind of a mechanical machine analog, that would be like your actuator, okay? And so your actuator is the only thing that you can actually, you know, supply with power and that can actually move, actively move your muscle, okay? But what I want to highlight here is that there are a lot of other factors in play inside your muscles and tendons that can, you know, that, that um, you know, that give forces that are not explicitly controlled by your body. That's not actively controlled, okay? And that's the PEC and the SEC. So let's go ahead and, and finally label these. And so the PEC stands for parallel elastic component. Okay. And so what these do is that these provide, um, you know, restoring forces uh, whenever the map, whenever the muscle is stretched, okay, uh, and these forces are provided by the muscle membranes, okay. And so this, and so this is the part that actually comes from the muscle itself, right? And so uh, the muscle itself, whenever you stretch it beyond its its normal length, the PEC is going to want to return it back to its original one without the muscle actively having to do anything. Okay. All right. Then we have the SEC, and so the SEC stands for the series elastic component. And so the SEC also provides a restoring force. And so just like the PEC, it's also a spring. Okay. But the SEC doesn't come from the, uh, it doesn't come from the, uh, from the muscle membranes. The SEC comes from the tendons. So PEC, SEC, they provide the same role. You know, they're both springs, okay? Um, it's just that where they come from is, is different. And, you know, in, in, the, in a lot of models, we separate them just because they, tendons and muscles tend to have very different properties. And so, you know, it's useful and, and convenient to separate them. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, any questions on, on this so far? And so again, you know, it's 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 a lot of it's a lot of long terms, I know, but you know, just just think of these as as springs, okay? And so I think if you think of them as springs, I think it, a lot of it kind of falls into place, okay? And just like springs, you know, um, you can actually store uh, potential energy inside these springs as well, right? Right. So if you think about a normal spring, whenever you stretch it or you or you compress it, you know, past its normal length, that energy that you use to actually stretch or compress it actually gets stored within the spring itself. Okay. Because it's that potential energy that actually you know, pushes the spring back to its uh, original position. Right? And so one way that we can think about that is from an energy perspective in terms of potential energy. Okay? And so what's, what's really interesting about this is that you know, your body actually makes use of this kind of elastic potential energy all throughout its day as well. Right? Um, and so you know, whenever you have a muscle or a tendon that's kind of stretched, your body kind of knows that it's, it's being, there's potential energy being stored in there. And so then it kind of utilizes that energy um, in other places as well, okay? So let me give you an example. And so, you know, let's say, you know, I'm, I'm, let's say, you know, I ask everyone to kind of get up from their seats right now and to jump as high as they can, right? You don't have to do it, but, you know, just, just imagine, it. just do image training for it, okay? And so if someone were, to, if someone were to tell you to jump as high as you can, you know, what's, what's probably the first thing that you would do, you know, before you actually go up to, to jump, right? Yeah, squat. squat down, exactly, right? Okay. And so, you know, you would maybe do something like this, okay? And so just kind of naturally, that's kind of what we think to do that's, that would kind of help us maximize our, our jump time, okay? But what's really going on? So why, why do we actually squat down to, to do this? Uh, well, first of all, you know, it helps, gener it helps us generate more momentum because it gives us more of a launch time, right? And so if we bend down and, you know, up until we jump up, that gives us more time to build up momentum to go forwards, right? So that's, that's, that's one reason. But the other reason actually has to do with these elastic components because, you know, kind of look what you're doing when you're stretching or you're bending down. And so if, in particular, you know, let's look at your calf muscles. And so your calf muscles are the muscles on the backs of your, of your lower leg. And let's look at your quadricep muscles, okay? And so your calf muscles and your quadriceps are, those are the, kind of the two main muscles that are involved in helping you jump, right? But as you squat down, you know, and you can kind of imagine this too, when you're, when you're crouching down, you know, these muscles feel like they're being stretched, right? Okay. And so what that's doing is that it's, you're in addition to, you know, uh, in addition to the active force that, you know, that you push upwards with, you know, what you're doing is you're storing potential energy inside the muscles and the tendons associated with your calves and quadriceps. Okay. Okay. 
And so when you do spring upwards, you know, when you do kind of release that, you know, part of the extra force that kind of helps you jump higher is that elastic potential energy that's stored inside your quadriceps and your tendons. Okay? And you can think of, you know, and this kind of applies to almost any kind of big action that you're trying to do, right? And so, um, you know, let's say that, you know, you, you're, you're faced with someone and they're really pissing you off. And so you want to just punch the shit out of them, right? And so if you want to punch them, right, you don't, you, you don't just kind of go from a standing punch like this. You really want to wind back so that you can kind of bring as much pain as you can, right? And so when you wind back, you're kind of doing the same thing where you're stretching a lot of the muscles um, and tendons in your chest and in your shoulder so you get maximum, maximum pain as much as possible, right? Um, and another, another uh, and, and we'll go over this later in the class once we get into motion, you know, actually just the simple, um, just the simple act of walking, right? Um, so as you walk, you know, we'll, we'll see this later that walking actually involves very little active forces from your body because what's happening is that as you kind of go from step to step, a lot of the potential energy is actually stored inside your limbs and that's released as you step and walk. And so what scientists have been able to do is that they've been able to develop these very simple walking robots that only require just kind of a small push. And so, you know, and, and we'll watch the video of this later. And so if you give these robots just a small push and they otherwise just have no motors at all, the robot actually has no problems walking because, you know, all you really need is just that small push and then you have the springs inside the robot kind of do most of the walking motion for you. So, you know, it's something that your body kind of does kind of automatically just because it's, it's, you know, your body's used to, you know, operating its muscles. But, you know, if you actually met, go inside, inside your body and measure, you know, how much force is actually coming from the muscles and how much is coming from just this elastic force, you'd be surprised to see how much contr uh, contribution these elastic forces uh, make. All right, any questions on, on this? Okay. All right, so that's the elastic uh, properties of muscles, okay? And so, you know, these two, extensibility and elasticity kind of go hand in hand, okay? The last two kind of have to do more with the active control of, of muscles, okay? Number three. So no, the number three uh, defining characteristic for muscles is what's called irritability. I spell that right. Okay. So irritability is the uh, ability for your muscles to respond to some kind of stimulus. So most of the time, you know, when we think of stimulus, we think of electrical signals from your, from your nervous system, right? And so when you want your muscles to do a certain thing, what happens is that your brain sends electrical signals down your nervous system to that muscle and that muscle, and then it tells that muscle to either contract or relax or stuff like that, okay? So that's, that's going to be the case for most of the time, but, but your muscles actually respond to mechanical stimulus as well. And so I think everyone's, you know, had this test done to them, you know, probably when they were a kid, when they're sitting on the doctor's table and the doctor takes the little mallet and hits your knee, and then you kick the doctor in the face. And so that's, that's kind of an example of, uh, of your muscles responding to a mechanical stimulus. And so just the fact that you can, you, can, you can stimulate a muscle and it can respond you know, um, you know, dynamically, um, that's, that's an important characteristic, right? Otherwise we, we wouldn't be able to control our muscles. Okay. All right, and the last one that kind of goes hand in hand with three is um, the ability to develop um, tension.
And this is what really makes muscles unique because there's, there's very few um, other tissues in your body that can actually develop forces kind of on the run, okay? And so most of the time, you know, when you develop tension within these muscles, it'll cause them to contract or, or shorten in length. Um, but it's also possible for muscles to produce tension even when they're not changing length as well, okay? But just, just, the, just this ability to produce, you know, relatively large forces for, you know, how big the muscles are, um, that's something that's, you know, very unique to them. And that's why they play such an important role in your body. Okay, okay. Um, any questions on, on this? Kind of, yeah. And so the fact the fact that you can send an electrical signal to the muscle, uh, or you can hit the muscle, and then it responds in a certain the fact that it can sense it and respond in a certain in any kind of way that's that's what irritability is. Yeah. yeah. So you know, just the fact that your muscles can you know can pull can pull on your bones that's that's what I mean by by tension. Yeah. So the ability that just or muscles can just produce force. That's, um, you know, all muscles can basically do that. Mm -hmm. All right, and so that's that's kind of the the uh, the defining characteristics of muscles. So let's see how that how these actually come to to be. Okay? So let's dive kind of into the uh, into the cellular cellular level of muscles. So you know, we're not going to stay here for too long. Okay, and so let's talk about the structural organization of a of a muscle. Okay. All right. And so a single muscle cell is often called a muscle fiber, right? And so, you know, your body is made up of all kinds of cells, but the muscle cell kind of has a unique name because of its, just because of kind of how it looks. It looks like a long string or a long fiber. Because I think most of the time when people think of cells or living cells in your body, you think, they think of like something that kind of looks like an amoeba, right? So kind of like globular in, in shape, but muscle shells are very unique in that they're very, they're very long. And in fact, they can be very, very long. And so, you know, I think they're one of the only cells that you can actually see with kind of the, the naked eye. Because a lot of cells are kind of too small for you to see. You need a microscope to see them. But, you know, if you look at certain muscles in your body, you see, you can see the threads kind of running through, through. Right? And so that's, that's kind of what makes them unique, okay? Okay, and so now there's some more, um, some more terminology. And so surrounding each muscle, uh, each muscle fiber is a membrane called the sarcolemma, okay?
And then inside the sarcolemma is, is a very specialized kind of fluid slash plasma called the sarcoplasm. And so it looks kind of something like this. And so you know, maybe on the outside, you know, this, this kind of outer membrane right here, this is the circle lemma. Okay. Here's the bottom circle lemma. Okay. And then inside the circle lemma is, is, is the fluid or, or the plasma. Right? And so, you know, it's a little bit hard to, draw, but you know, imagine the empty space here, that's the circle class. Okay. All right, but the, but the parts that's actually really important are, are, are not really the circle, the, the membrane or the plasma, it's actually the protein filaments in, in between, okay? So let me go ahead, and let's, let me draw them first, because I think it's, it's good for you to visualize them first before we start talking about them. And so I think a concept everyone is familiar with is that, you know, if you want to build muscle in your body, then you need to eat protein, right? And that's true because a lot of the, a lot of the structure inside a muscle is made up of what these things are called protein filaments, okay? All right, and so these, these ones that I've drawn here, these are called actin. Okay? And so the actin kind of form these kind of little envelopes inside your muscle, okay? Actually, it'd be good if I kind of color code them. So let me do that. Okay, so in green right here, these are the actin. And then in orange, I'm gonna draw the other protein filament called the myosin. Okay. So the myosin kind of look like this. And so they kind of exist inside the actin. And they have kind of these leaflet things that attach to the actin. And here it's kind of cut off, but you know, we have a myosin here as well. Okay. So in orange here, these are called myosin. Okay. And so these protein filaments, these are the ones that are doing kind of most of the work in terms of contraction, okay? That's why they're kind of, you know, the most important thing. And so, you know, I kind of drew this, you know, very kind of intentionally, because if you, if you kind of see here, I drew, I drew these with kind of this gap here on purpose, right? Okay. And the reason I drew, I drew those things with the gap is that the way, when a muscle is instructed to contract or when a muscle is instructed to produce force, 
what happens is that these myosin heads right here, these, these little leaflets, what they do is they kind of rotate, they kind of rotate inward, okay? And as they rotate inward, it kind of pulls these two actin uh, envelope sheets kind of towards each other, okay? And it's through, it's through the action of those, you know, myosin heads rotating, that's what produces the force. And that's what causes your, your, your entire muscle to contract, okay? And so I've, I've only just drawn a few units like this, but in reality, you know, for a typical muscle cell, you might have, you know, hundreds of these kind of linked up together, right? And so it looks like from here, you know, if you rotate it a little bit, it's not gonna cause that much of a contraction. But if you can imagine, you know, hundreds of these kind of do all doing at the same time, you can cause a very large contractile force and a very large kind of um, contraction motion, okay? And so that's kind of the, the primary mechanism through which uh, muscles produce, produce force, okay? All right. And a couple other, a couple other uh, points of trivia, huh? just because you might see these, uh, these names, okay? The actin, because they're, they're a lot thinner, sometimes they're, they're often called the thin filaments, And the myosin, since they're since they're thicker, these are often called the thick filaments. Okay? Any questions on, on this? All right. Let's see what's next. Okay. And so of course, you know, this is this is a you know very generic muscle. And so you know, every muscle in your body is, is structured just a little bit differently, but uh, you know, they all kind of have this this actin and myosin kind of interactions. Okay, and so let's talk about how these are controlled. And so, you know, we talked, we talked a bit earlier about how muscles often receive signals from the brain through the nervous system, and that causes them to act, okay? And so the way, the way it works is that, you know, your brain, your, your body isn't sophisticated enough to send each individual signal to each individual muscle fiber, right? So you don't, you don't have that level of control over the muscles. Just because of you know how much, how, just because of how many muscle fibers there are on your body, that's that's kind of way too much processing for your brain, your brain to do. Okay, uh, but theoretically, you know, if it was possible, you know, to control every single muscle fiber individually, you know, you could you could do theoretically a lot of very small, fine movements very, very well, right? And so my handwriting would probably be a lot better if I could control every muscle fiber in my hand. But because I can't, my handwriting kind of kind of sucks. Uh, and so instead, what your body does is that it groups um, several muscle fibers together into what are called motor units. Okay?
And so what's unique about the motor units is that all the muscle fibers within a motor unit all kind of act together, right? And so when your brain sends a signal, it sends it to the motor unit and then the motor unit tells all the muscle fibers to do um, all the same thing, okay? And so that kind of helps to alleviate. And so, you know, certain muscle fibers that kind of produce the same action or same uh, you know, uh, force, you know, your body can kind of group them together. So your brain can kind of control them all with just one, one signal. Okay. But of course, you know, there's, there's variations on this as well. And so that's, you know, why you get, you know, some people are kind of born to be surgeons because they, they're much better in terms of controlling their muscles and controlling, you know, how fine they are, right? And then you have people like me who can't even like install batteries inside their, uh, their remote control because my hands shake too much, right? And so, you know, um, I think that's one thing that makes biology so fascinating is that, you know, we have all this knowledge, but then, you know, even within that, there's, there's an incredible amount of variation between people in terms of how their different muscles are, you know, first of all, in the geometry of the muscle, but then how they're grouped in terms of how the brain can control them as well. And so there's so many different levels of this, you know, I think we'll be studying biology until, until the end of time. Okay. Okay. Um, let's talk. Let's talk about how um, how your how your uh, brain actually does control these uh, these motor units. Okay. And so to and so when your brain sends a signal to a motor unit, it basically tells it it, it basically tells it to uh, contract. Right. All right. Question. Um, so is there a way to measure how stable someone's hand is with how much we know? Yeah. Yeah, there's there's definitely some way that you can um, you can measure that. I think um, you know you can kind of just uh, um, kind of observe it, and so you know you can view it with a high speed camera, and you can see how much you know how much wiggle or how much steadiness there is to their hand. Okay, and so some people with a lot of control will be able to keep their hand incredibly still, right? They'll have kind of perfect control of their muscle. Um, but I think for a lot of people, you know, there's always going to be some kind of little sway because of how um, you know your body is kind of adjusting to gravity, right? And so your body's all at the same time trying to, trying to prevent your hand from falling down to the table. And so there has to be some muscle action that, that keeps it afloat, but then, you know, how much control you have over that compared to, um, compared to others, you know, is, is going to be different. Uh, but if you're asking in terms of like electrical signals, there, there are ways, um, there are ways for the, for us to measure kind of the electrical signals, your, your, your brain sends to your muscles, but they're not, it's hard, it's hard to measure because you're kind of measuring, you're trying to measure electrical signals oftentimes from the surface of the skin. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to get a good reading because, you know, the electrical signal has to pass through the skin and then up a probe and stuff like that. And so a lot of times those get dispersed. Yeah. And so the most reliable way is just to kind of just observe how they're, how they're doing. And so when your brain controls your muscles, I, I think it's, it's more simple than a lot of people think. And so it's really just a, it's just a, a it's just a, a, basically just a green light, right? And so it's, it's, your brain basically plays red light, green light with all your muscles. And so when your muscles are given the green light, your brain says contract, do something, uh, or it just tells it nothing and then it just relaxes, okay? And so that's, and so your muscles only have two modes, really. It's either on or it's off. And so, you know, that's, uh, um, that's how, that's how muscles work, okay? The reason we can get like such complex movements, right? Is that, you know, first of all, you know, we have lots of different muscles in our body. And so, you know, your brain can kind of send multiple signals to different muscles and, and the combination of their contractions can produce, you know, very complex actions, right? Um, but at the same time too, a single, a, just a single signal from the brain actually doesn't tell the muscle to contract too much. And so it's, it's kind of a very small response. Okay. 
And so speaking, speaking of electrical signals, you know, we, we are able to measure the electrical signals for some muscles, the ones that are kind of positioned well. And the results have actually been really fascinating. And so, you know, what scientists have found, you know, let's say that we have, um, you know, on the, on the x-axis here, we have time. And on the y-axis, let's say we have muscle force. Okay. And so, you know, let's say that the maximum amount of force that this, this muscle can produce is somewhere up here, right? So let me draw kind of a dotted line up here. And so this dotted line represents, you know, the maximum amount of force that the, that, that the, that the muscle as a whole can produce. Okay. And so what scientists have found is that, you know, when the brain sends a signal to a muscle to contract, it doesn't actually get anywhere near this, this maximum force. And so, you know, let's say, you know, I'm gonna draw kind of a little box around here, okay? And so let's say that this box here kind of represents if the brain just sent a single pulse, okay? okay. Just a single green light. And so a single electrical signal makes it to your brain, to your muscles, okay? And what they've observed is that the muscle will generate some force, okay? Back on a better line. Okay, so the muscle force will, it, it will start to come up because, you know, it received the signal. But, you know, if it only receives one signal, then very quickly, the muscle force actually dies down, okay? And so you have kind of this, like, you know, it rises up and then it kind of dies down if it doesn't get any more signals, okay? So it, it actually doesn't last very long. And so in order, for your, in order for your body to kind of um, put in a sustained amount of force or to kind of reach a higher amount, what the brain does is that it sends kind of a volume of signals. Okay. And so what they've observed is actually interesting. And so if you, you know, let's say that, you know, I, I put like a, a five pound weight in your hand and I tell you to lift it up, right? And so if you were to measure kind of the electrical activity inside that muscle, it would actually look something like this. And so, you know, the muscle will send us, the, the brain will send a signal. And so the muscle will start ramping up, but then you start to actually see this decay. But before the decay actually goes all the way down, the brain will send another signal, okay? And then same thing's gonna happen. And then, you know, before it goes down, the brain will send another signal and another signal and another signal, okay? And this is gonna keep happening until you reach kind of full, full force like that, okay? And so each little peak right here is kind of a separate signal to the muscle, right? And so in order to, in order to get kind of larger amounts of movement, larger amounts of force, it actually takes several signals from your brain to, to actually produce that, All right, any questions on, on this? All right, and so that's all we got time for today. So it's 5.15. And so on Tuesday, we'll pick this up again. And so we'll continue our discussion of muscles. And so I think, I think it'll probably take us all day Tuesday to, to talk more about muscles. And then next Thursday, we'll talk about joints, okay? All right, and so you know, I know this part of the class is a bit slow because it, it's just biology, and so we're, we're not doing any calculations yet. But you know, we kind of have to get through this stuff first before we can actually start doing the calculations, right? All right, so uh, thank you everyone for tuning in today. Thank you everyone for coming to the class. Um, you know, hope you guys enjoy your weekend, and I will see everyone on Tuesday. Stay cool. It's going to be really hot this weekend, so you know, try to avoid being outside if you can. Stay hydrated, and you know, stay cool. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Thank you.
Yeah. All the things do to work. So I've got to put things down. I'm, gonna, I'm about to change the size of the circle. So okay. So I mean, Questions. Sure. I'm gonna lose access to a computer that has access mm -hmm. after 7 p.m. today. Okay. Uh -huh. Is there a way I can do it without like screenshotting everything before that I can do it like now? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can work on it during the class today. Um, you know. Um, just get all the screenshots that you need. So, I mean, it's all the other screenshots are just like the small tinkering. That's what change the mesh density, change the mesh elements, you know, change the whole size. So, you want, if you can do that all in the class today, get your screenshots, then you can do the rest of the right of that. Awesome. And just for the first one, like after increasing the load from like a thousand to nine thousand, yeah, like deformation increased. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so. So the original one was actually ten thousand. So when you go from ten thousand to nine thousand, it actually decreases. And so your deformations and your stress just actually goes. Okay. Yeah. That's weird. well on the paper it said one thousand. Yeah, I know it's it, it's a typo. Oh. It should say it should say Sorry. decrease from ten thousand to nine thousand. So, okay. I, I keep I as a typo every year, and I and I always forget to I always forget to fix it. Okay. <laughs> My predictions were based off 1,000 to 3,000 hours. Should I change those? And that's then... that's okay. I mean, so you can, you can just say your prediction that, you know, I predicted that from 1,000 to 9,000, it would go up by a okay. factor of nine, but yeah. it was actually 10,000 to 9,000. So, okay. so you don't have to change anything. Got it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Is it saying that in adrenaline rush or is going to be like It's in adrenaline rush. Ah, so adrenaline, adrenaline rush. That's uh, so when you when you are on adrenaline, you kind, you kind of heighten a lot of the uh, uh, the capabilities of your body. So, you know, something like this, you know, would probably happen a little bit faster because you know um, your brain is is going to be on a little bit on hyper hyper move, and so you know the time in between signals like this will be smaller, and so that kind of helps you react faster because signals get through your brain to your muscles faster. It helps you kind of move faster too. Normally, if you don't have adrenaline, then you know it takes it takes a bit of time for you to act like this. But on adrenaline, just everything here just kind of gets chill. Um, in terms of project, you know, said to to write a report or on any like uh, improvised thing or something like that. Yes. Uh, my what? question is, my brother works in J and J. Okay. And uh, I don't know what component he works, but uh, I told him and he told him like he can help me. So okay, okay. Can, can I take help of him? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. Um, I mean, I, I don't want him to reveal any kind of company secrets from there. So you know, I think that's something he has to be careful about. Yeah, I'll ask him. Um, but yeah, let's 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 talk more later in, in the semester then about what what that could be. Like. So yeah. All right. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I had a question. Yep. What about when people are paralyzed? Can I use so, can I be right. So, par so paralysis can happen, you know, for, for a lot of different reasons. So, for so one, the one way is that you know, because you have basically wires that connect like your brain to your to your muscles, and so for some paralyzed people, those that wiring actually gets messed up, and so the signals just don't even reach the muscles at all. But for some, for some, um, for some other types of paralysis, you know, the signals can reach the muscles, but they're compromised in a way where they just can't respond, and so they kind of lose the ability to. So they're tension. getting the signal, but they're just not moving. Exactly, exactly. So it, it depends on kind of what's causing that, that paralysis. And we could test that? Yes, you can test that. Okay. And so kind of the device I was talking before where you can measure the electrical signals. Mm -hmm. And so you can put those on the muscle and you can see if it's receiving the signals. Oh, okay. And so if it's if you put that on the on there and then you know the person is trying to move his arm, but you know, but no signal is there, that means that the wiring has been cut off basically. There's, there's no signal going to the muscle at all. Uh, but if you put it there and then you actually see the um, the electrical signals, then something happened to the muscles where it can't respond. So there's different variations. Different right? variations, yeah. yeah. Usually the second one you can tell too because like you can you can kind of see. Usually the muscle very the muscle very. Just, like, there's there's that, but then there's also there's also times where it's like you know you can see the muscle like trying trying to move too, or like you, it, it's clearly kind of responding and twitching. It's just not doing what the person wants it to. Do. And so that's 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 kind of a telltale sign that the signal is reaching there. The person's trying, it's just the muscle just can't respond like it, like it wants to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm.